I do well is I understand money. CV gets a bit hazy at my age. Oh god, there were so many high points. I mean, I've been blessed in this industry to have amazing high points. Our work in Turkey, you know, really helped bring inflation down for a long time. That was amazing. Um, brainstorming with Kudrin, the then uh, Russian finance minister, on how to alleviate poverty more effectively in Russia. That was an amazing moment. Uh, one high point was the first time I flew in a private jet, uh, more capitals private, uh, or my boss's private jet. Uh, it was 1999, I think. So it was two years later or something. That was a serious high point. Flying into uh, New York and sitting in the private jet and the customs and immigration come in and apologize to you for keeping you uh, delayed. And you're sitting there signing the forms while you're sitting on a chair. I don't know, for some reason, given the number of times that I'd stood in immigration queues and I mean, that just did it for me. So I think that was a serious high point. I was uh, one day in Moore Capital and they brought up the post and I opened it. It was my black Centurion American Express card. And I, was, I wasn't 30 years old yet. That was, from a very shallow perspective, a real high point. So a lot of people say to me that, you know, I'm such a uh, non-materialistic person now, but I wasn't when I was that age. I mean, that was a big deal, getting the Ameri Black American Express before 30. So many, I, I just, there were so many highs. I, the highs, there were many. The evening, early evening, um, of my last working day at English Trust, when my boss at the time gave me a contract for a full-time job offer that was for £12,500 a year. So he had been paying me pro rata £25,000 a year. So, you know, on that basis, so 500 a week or whatever it was. And then he gave me this, uh, uh, so it was 500 a week, that's right, sorry. So it was 26,000 was what he was paying me pro rata, 500 a week. And then he gave me this contract for 13,000, I think it was, a year. And I asked him why, and he said, well, you're 28 years old, where else are you gonna go? So do you pay 13,000 a year? at the age of 28, given all the degrees I'd done and my belief in myself was definitely the low point of my career. I was brutally bad at it for that reason. So what happened was that I, um, I actually, the chip on my shoulder actually got bigger. While I was working in charities where I just saw all I could see was the broad numbers. And I was saying, well, there are all these rich people in the world. If they all just gave their money to the poor people, there would be no global hunger, blah, blah, blah. So I was really into that. So as soon as I got to um, Citibank, which I did through nepotism, by the way. So, you know, I always tell everyone that, you know, this is not a stellar career in its origins. You know, I, I got that job purely because um, a very, very senior individual at Citibank his father was a very close family friend of our family and was the Speaker of the National Assembly, um, equivalent to the US Speaker, Nancy Pelosi, if you like. Well, it's not Nancy Pelosi anymore, but the Speaker of the House of Representatives um, back in Pakistan. He was a very close family friend. 
and his son was a very senior individual at Citibank here in London, number three globally at the time or something like that, very, very senior. And he basically uh, gave me the job, summer internship, so you got it. Uh, if you tutor my son and get him into Cambridge. So I got his son into Cambridge, he got me the job. And, uh, and I ruined it. I uh, basically would go in into meetings with rich people and I would have all these leaflets from Oxfam and you know any charity and I'd just sneak them in. And I would like, and they'd be telling me to organize, you know, uh, days out at Harrods and, you know, financing for the latest yacht and I would be yeah and you know that's gonna be 10 million and if you put a hundred thousand here we could save a thousand children and I kept doing this and I remember the last day of my internship and my uh, Zubair his name was uh, the son of the family friend and he was so embarrassed I've never seen a man so embarrassed he was sitting opposite me and he said Muzaffar I'm so sorry we can't hire you because two vice presidents have come in and said they will resign if I hire you. And I have yet to this day seen anyone do that badly that people will give up their own careers rather than work with them, you know. I mean, that's, that story has never been bettered. So when I say I really know how to mess up, I really know how to mess up in this in industry. You know, and he said, I'm just so, he was so embarrassed because it was expected that I, and he just couldn't. And uh, yeah, so that uh, that was Citibank. So that chip on the shoulder. I learned a very painful lesson that day. That it's all good and well to say speak truth to power, but it gets you fired. <laughs> The reason it kind of happened was that in 1992, when I um, was going through the process of working in hedge fund sales in fixed income at uh, Goldman Sachs, I was interviewing for that position. And I got to the final round and the head of my desk was going to be a lady called Noreen Harrington. And Noreen wanted me on the desk, was a, a, you know, a wonderful sponsor of mine within the uh, ever since the first interview stages. And she, um, in my last interview, after my last interview the day before, she'd said, just come in tomorrow and the partner will sign you off and welcome to the team. And the next day um, I come in and she goes, I'm sorry, Brace uh, uh, is not uh, in today. He's got the flu or something. But there's a partner in from uh, New York called Chip Selig and he will do your interview. I'm just imagining my life at Goldman Sachs, you know, all the stories I've heard, you know, the, the time in you know, the US as a graduate, you know, just wild stories and I'm like completely pumped up. And um, I walk in and I sit down and I'm like just imagining myself on the floor, etc. And then this guy walks in and my heart sinks. Because I don't know if this has ever happened to any of you here, but uh, I don't know if you've ever met someone in your life and you look at them and you know they hate you on sight. And there is nothing you can do. Nothing at all. You haven't breathed yet wrong, but just disliked me. And he sat down opposite me and I still maintain it was the best interview I ever gave. I knew every answer. I was sincere. I looked at him. I did everything right. And every few seconds he would go like this. It was soul crushing. And then he finally gets up and leaves. And Noreen is standing outside the glass door and she starts saying to him, yes? And he goes, no. And she goes, what do you mean no? And she raised her voice, now I can hear it. And he goes, I don't think he's suitable for the position. He goes, it's not your desk, it's my desk. I think he is suitable. And they start arguing. And I'm sitting there, 23 year old boy with his whole life in the balance going, Noreen, come on, win this argument, just this one. And uh, after that, I got, I swear, I think it was like 10 minutes. It seemed like 10 minutes to me, maybe it was less. She walks in, shoulders slumped and goes, Mazafra, I'm so sorry. Um, we can't hire you, but if I ever get the chance to hire you again, I will. And I walked out and I was so angry. I was like, typical, you know, GS, this is crap. I was so angry. And uh, then 
May, May 1997, the day that uh, Farid, my ex-boss, gives me this contract at English Trust saying uh, £13,000 a year and where am I going to go? That night was the worst. That evening was the worst of my life and I was thinking of calling my dad up and saying, you were right, I'm an idiot, I should have come back to Pakistan. I'm ready to pack up my bags and come and work in the civil service in Pakistan. And I got a call from Noreen Harrington. And she says, I've just joined Barclays as a global head of fixed income. I didn't forget my promise. You're going to come work for us. And, you know, the moments like that happen in your life. And it's like a movie. And it's like, I'm not going to repeat what I said on camera to my boss next day about what he could do with his contract. Uh, but that was amazing. Um, and so I started it. Uh, Barclays, right? Because the very bank that I was cursing was the one that kept its promise. A Goldman Sachs woman kept her promise, you know? So it tells you that you completely misread people and they, you know, you have to give people a bit of a doubt and you've got to keep going, you know? So I turn up at Barclays and a few days later, randomly, um, I meet a colleague of Noreen's, Mark Cheval, and um, he is um, in a lunch queue. And we start talking, and then we realize that he was a year ahead of me at LSE. And I'd seen him around at LSE, and we had a friend in common, a guy called uh, Amir Mir. And uh, so uh, we were like, oh yeah, and, you know, how are you, etc. We started talking. And then Mark started giving me some research projects, you know, do this for us, do that for us, etc. And I started doing them. And um, like three months later, I think it was August um, of uh, 1997, uh, Mark and his proprietary team, he'd come over as the head of proprietary trading for Barclays from Goldman. They called the Asian crisis, right? and made Barclays over a hundred million dollars, a huge amount of money for Barclays in those days. They'd never seen that kind of money from a trading desk. But more significantly, on a daily basis, in terms of client coverage, he was talking to a gentleman called Lewis Bacon, who was head of more capital management, at that time, the third largest hedge fund in the world. And he had made Lewis, through his advice, hundreds of millions. So Lewis was a big fan of Mark and said, come over. And Mark took half the team, Mark going him, to more capital. But in the same way that Noreen kept faith with me, Mark had always said to me that if you do this work for me for free, I won't forget you. And when he went to more capital, he uh, asked to hire me. And, uh, and he did. So actually I started as a junior execution trader um, and then became a, st a strategist. So that evolved over time. Um, that evolution looks very startling in a year to have moved to a strategy role, but it was kind of pre-planned. I was always gonna go in the direction of ultimately becoming a fund manager and that's what I was being groomed to do there. So um, there was always an understanding that you know the promotions would come rapidly and this was more a desire from their part to get me to be comfortable with all aspects of the job and to really deeply understand liquidity from the buy side's perspective um, so yeah that transition as i said happened within a year and then the last four years were devoted to just, you know, being an analyst, stroke strategist for a more emerging market fund. Um, and of course, the work itself changed from being fully focused on understanding liquidity in different assets. It moved to understanding and delving into more the fundamentals of the trade ideas, the um, a deeper focus on the world economy, both from a political and from an economic perspective, and lastly, um, geopolitical relationships.
the Russia trade, November uh, 98 Russia, that was an outstanding trade that was put on by the team because in August of that year, the Russians had defaulted on their Soviet era debt. But then we thought about it as a team and we said, but they never defaulted on their Russian debt, debt that was actually issued by the Russian Federation, but not a Soviet debt. And while everyone else in the market was extremely pessimistic about Russians honoring their debt, etc., we decided to go in, you know, in a very substantial size. We're talking hundreds of millions of dollars as a bank, um, as a fund, into Russia in '98, and that trade made more capital a ton of money because the Russians honored their debt, and uh, you know we were buying stuff at 30, 35 cents on the dollar which then went to par. So you can imagine how much that made over three to four years. Um, and that trade just kept giving to the fund and to our uh, own uh, uh, book throughout most of my career at More Capital. That was a great trade with zero downside, great visionary trade for which the team has to be uh, given the credit. Um, the second trade was Turkey and Turkey was one of our definitely top three, where we went in and we literally helped create, we put in a lot of intellectual input into the program that the IMF created for Turkey, which stabilized their inflation, and actually improved millions of lives by finally tackling inflation at its source. But Turkey also gave us one of our worst days when Demir Bank collapsed and we lost over a hundred million dollars in a day. Now we knew, the three of us, that this was an anomaly and this was something that could be rectified. But we had to go and convince Lewis that this had to be done. And to Mark's credit, and that's why you know he had the big bucks, he went in, convinced Lewis, and we doubled our trade. And that trade was pretty much, I would say, the reason I retired, because we made so much money as a uh, team on that trade uh, but that was tough the day that Demir Bank collapsed and we dropped a hundred million you know we were joking with each other not joking actually we were saying we were actually started packing up all our stuff because we thought we were out um, and you know before the security came in and told us to step away from the desks so we were like putting all our stuff and Mark was going to go off to France I was going to run to Pakistan because I thought Lewis was never going to forgive me and uh Marco was going to be okay because, uh, you know, he was just going to go back to the States. And uh, that was a tough day. To me, raising aspirations in the young of the world, making sure that we leave behind a planet that can sustain humankind without massive change. These are incredibly inclusive ideas and that's what attracts me to them. Over time, I was always, you know, from a very young age, looking to do good. And I remember being seven, I think I was seven years old and going to a supermarket in Pakistan and seeing the first Superman comic and falling in love with the DC universe. So there are people who are Marvel guys, so I was very strictly a DC comics boy growing up. Since then, you know, the Marvel films are incredible, but I was, you know, we reading a Marvel comic was a betrayal of the DC universe, you know, so that's how we thought about it. Um, but. You know, when I read uh, the, my, almost my first Superman comic and then I started reading that whole philosophy of doing good, it just resonated. For me, it was something that I, I love the idea of being responsible for contributing to the world. I don't know why, right? I have rationalized this, you know, it was the influence of my father. Yes, it was. But other people have had fathers who are just as benevolent and 
um, caring about the world. Uh, it was the influence of um, good teachers, yes, but other people have had good teachers. So I don't know what constantly drove me from the inside towards contribution. And uh, I'm not sure I ever will know. For Manico, which was the largest part of, uh, of my time there, I was out looking for companies that uh, would create returns for investors while bringing down um, or decreasing global warming. And uh, so there were a number of uh, companies that I, at that time, recommended to man to invest in for that purpose. Um, so that was my job, finding companies that they thought could make them money and solve the environmental, the increase in environmental pollution um, and I basically delivered suggestions to them of these companies and I did due diligence on them and said these are the best companies that are most likely to not only effectively bring down pollution but also make you a lot of money. So that was our relationship. So this is a question that has been, uh, uh, you know, asked by many people for over 20 years now, which is you know, why pay these huge fees to fund managers, hedge fund managers specifically, when um, all you have to do is just have a guy track an index and pay him a nominal amount to do that. And the answer has to do with the fact that those who are wealthy will always try to outperform in their investments the same way that they outperform in whatever business from which the wealth was originally created. So they are predisposed to believing that alpha, i.e. excessive returns to the market can be found. So a lot of the times hedge funds are preaching to the choir or their investment relations teams are preaching to the choir because the rich people are predisposed to hearing the idea that there is an inside track or there is a better way to make money. And I think that human psychology is the reason why hedge funds have survived for so long. Some have genuinely outperformed the markets, many have not. Um, but that psychology seems to still be driving it. And when you look at the assets flooding into non-tracking funds, that, that psychology does not seem to have abated. By the time it was 2006, I had been mentoring for 13 years. And, you know, I had mentored both on Wall Street, the UK finance industry, the teenagers, 14 to 18 year olds, thousands of people by that time. And I thought there's got to be a more efficient way to get across the general uh, useful information that I have that can contribute to helping people enhance their careers or help them in certain aspects of their lives. And the book for me was a natural medium. You know, I wasn't tech savvy enough to think about blogs and you know the other things that other people have done. So for me, it was like, okay, write a book, and this will mean that you know I can help many more people without actually uh, even seeing them. One of the joys of mentoring for twenty-two years is that you will always come across people who are doing completely different things in life. So, you know, in the past I've mentored uh, film directors, racing car drivers, uh, people trying to get into uh, the Olympics, and um, just a huge range of human beings. 
and so that's how I met Harald. Harald is a racing car driver, um, and he was going through a bit of a uh, bad patch where there were a couple of years where he wasn't getting the races in Formula 3 and GT championships, which were his forte, if you like. We started talking and there was this immediate connection. And uh, I knew the areas in his business life where he needed help. And I became his mentor. So um, I advise him on every area of his life. Uh, uh, when I say every area, like in the, mostly on the business side and also on career goals, the same way that I did with the finance industry people. So in terms of managing careers, if you like, and advising on careers, it is not different from uh, advising people in the finance industry. Both are high pressure jobs. In both cases, there are negotiations involved with uh, investors, business partners, uh, how to deal with uh, you know with things like your internal critic, uh, and also to think about your public profile and so on. And that in that aspect, it's very similar to the CEOs. So it was the struggles that first got me into mentoring uh, professionals. So 1999, I uh, was at More Capital. By this time, I was the stra I was a strategist for More Emerging Market Fund, and I remember one very weird week where two saleswomen from different investment banks took me out for dinner uh, to discuss the markets and you know sales. Uh, uh, and uh, buy side relationship of the firm and in both cases they burst into tears and it was a very surreal mo two very surreal moments where I really didn't know what to do and we started talking and exactly what you talk about the pressures had become so much that somehow they felt that I was empathic enough and respectful enough to for them to be able to be vulnerable. So we started talking. And they were the ones that I first started mentoring in the industry. And uh, from their stories and the way I helped them grew the mentoring that has now been going on for 16 years. Uh, and you know the hundreds of people in the finance industry that I've since mentored, um, dealing with a number of these issues from Oh gosh, I mean, they've ranged from some uh, sexism, definitely. There was a lot of that in the early stages. Uh, conflict based on verbal and emotional abuse by seniors in other cases. Unfairness. when allocating uh, projects or accounts, etc. Just a huge range. Life, basically, you could say. There are five pieces of advice that I tend to give. Number one is treat sleep like a bank account. Deposit sleep whenever you can. So what I always say to them, number one is deposit sleep. So literally my mentees will on a Friday night and a Saturday night go home and get to sleep as soon as they can and then have the luxury of waking up on Saturday morning and Sunday morning without an alarm clock. So I say, don't use an alarm clock. Let the body just feel like it's being, you know, getting a holiday. And the effect of that, so some people will still only sleep nine or 10 hours, 
Others will sleep 14 or 15 hours, but the body will recuperate at its own pace. That's the number one thing I say. Make sure to deposit sleep whenever you can. Number two is to change your eating habits drastically. Uh, one of the things that I constantly tell people is that moderate the amount of alcohol that you have because the idea of the unwinding done through alcohol is false in the long term. What ends up happening is that while it may lead to, lead to feelings of unwinding at the time, the next day you end up feeling for reasons, and I've seen this again and again, that people just feel a bit depressed, a bit down. The high leads to a low, which they start to confuse as a work-related low. And I've seen that so often. Okay? And that leads to burnout. Uh, the third thing, I have to articulate it because I do it very strictly, don't do drugs, right? Now that sounds like something somebody says to a 15 year old, you know, uh, and so on. But it is important, you know, the availability of drugs in the finance industry is still a problem. And there is sometimes peer pressure to take it. One of the things that is not acknowledged enough is that there are two sides of the drug trade. There are buyers as well, right? And we don't do enough to deal with the demand side of it. And one of the things that I really work with my mentees is for them to resist the pressure when so-called cool people are taking drugs around them. Uh, because that again is presented to them as a way to deal with the pressure, a way to unwind, a way to relax, and so on, but in fact have devastating effects in the medium term on their sense of inner relaxation. Okay? So that's the third thing. The fourth thing that we talk about is dealing with the internal critic. So. What ends up happening is that it is not always the work that is exhausting. It is not always the time and the hours that take away the energy. It is the internal critic who starts to say, why can't you do this faster? Why are you so stupid? Why are you not clicking with this? You know, you should have done this, you should have done that. You know, the shoulds start pounding at your brain and they accelerate for most human beings as they grow more tired. The fifth is understand that you are evolving. That just because it is hard today, this is not a narrative for the rest of your life. This is a dynamic moment in your evolution in this industry, right? Just if you don't believe me, I say to them, Look at the uh, people who are two or three levels above you. They are not doing pitch books till 12 at night, right? So this too will end. You know, this is a transitory moment. And the ones who crack are the ones who confuse a transitory moment with a snapshot of their entire life. I didn't. I had no idea that the steps I was taking the right ones. Uh, my mother would tell you that in fact I took all the wrong steps. So, you know, uh, certainly I have plenty of critics with very legitimate points of view in this area. Um, I took the best steps that I could based on my level of evolution at the time. You know, that's the best I can say, and honestly, that's what any human being can say. What I hope is that I am willing, able, and helped by others 
to continue evolving, to continue to make better informed decisions, and decisions based on a greater sense of self-awareness. Wow, that's a tough one. Living London. I'm a, I'm a London guy, you know. Friends of mine, they're in New York. They could not, never imagine living anywhere else. I'm a London guy. Uh, work is more nuanced. Both places at more capital were a real pleasure to work at. So I couldn't break them up work-wise for you. Pope Francis, Barack Obama, and Bill Clinton. I love free economics um, just because I think that it it really forces us to walk away from our prejudices and our preconceptions and tells us look at the data, you know, look at the truth and react to truth rather than prejudice or preconceived notions. The second book uh, that everyone in the industry has to read is Liar's Poker. I mean, it's just so well written and so on. The third is Barbarians at the Gate, um, a book about private equity, because I think it has a great deal of interesting knowledge, again, written very well. Um, and I think these three are the kind of basic books because they're all fun, but they teach a lot. Pope Francis. He is the first Pope in my lifetime who has articulated a universal vision for the Catholic Church to take the largest and one of the most complex and the richest organization in the world, which the Catholic Church is, and to bend it to your will is an amazing feat. Barack Obama. You know, a black man became president. I don't know how you beat that. <laughs> I mean, you know, he is an incredible inspiration to the world. I mean, this is a man who just did not listen to his internal critic. I mean, if there's one man who never listened, you know, to people, I'm sure hundreds of people told him, that you can't do this, no one's ever done this, you know, it's impossible. It li literally was until he did it. I mean, that's success. The internal agreement with yourself of having achieved your aspirations, that's the only success that makes you truly happy. So if you believe, truly believe, not, you know, the way that uh, some uh, gurus, uh, these uh, life gurus, etc., say, "Oh, I am successful." I'm su not like that, but truly, believe um, that you have reached the aspirations that you set out for yourself, and that is a reality which is objective to you. That is success. <laughs> To contribute more efficiently and I'm determined to do that I'm determined to not let my any false humility uh, from getting in the way of organizing teams to deliver um, to young people and to try to facilitate solutions to make people's lives easier on a daily basis, um, help reduce global warming, um, and actually 
this is a pet project um, and this is where I will need to create many more teams is to really get the young people in the world to vote I'm very passionate about that because I think that there should be no taxation without representation I think it's a bedrock of democracy and I think that the reality of the way that the voting is done is that the consequence of apathy by the young electorate means that they have policies like the tripling of the tuition fee imposed on them without them actually getting a say because they are not voting. So that is something I'm passionate about doing, though I don't dedicate that much time to it because I don't know how much value I can add to the debate. But any way that I can, I will try.